Welcome to FYI, the four-year innovation podcast. This show offers an intellectual discussion on technologically enabled disruption, because investing in innovation starts with understanding it. To learn more, visit arc-invest.com. Arc Invest is a registered investment advisor focused on investing in disruptive innovation. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. It does not constitute either explicitly or implicitly any provision of services or products by ARC. All statements made regarding companies or securities are strictly beliefs and points of view held by ARC or podcast guests and are not endorsements or recommendations by ARC to buy, sell, or hold any security. Clients of ARC Investment Management may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Welcome to ARC's For Your Innovation podcast. Today we have an amazing guest. We have the CEO of Mineric, which is a leading laser communication company, uh, and that's Bulent Alton. Uh, he's got an incredible background, and I won't take up any more time, so we'll just cut right to the conversation. Will you show up for the first uh, orbital Starship launch? Is, is that on your uh, on your to do list? Ah, uh, that's gonna be tough. Uh, depends on where I'm at, on which side of the Atlantic I am. There are so many things going on. I love I love what my com- old company is doing, and they're real, definitely pushing the envelope, but uh, they have so many things going on on my own. It's like, if I can make it, I'd definitely want to be there. <laughs> gotcha. Maybe, maybe that'll be where we meet for the first time. Um, yeah. But just going into it, you know, this is ARCS for your innovation podcast. We talk to innovators uh, in the space and Bulent, you're, you're uh, one of the pioneers, I would say, in the space industry. You know, we're talking about SpaceX. Uh, was was SpaceX where you first got started in the space industry or were you somewhere before that? To be fair, um, SpaceX is the company that I joined right after graduating from Stanford. So it was my first job after finishing my school. But overall, I've been in the space industry also while going to university. I was in a uh, lunar uh, orbiter program and I was in Technical University of Munich. In Stanford, I did uh, I did two different things. I was working for Bob Twiggs, who was credited with uh, inventing the CubeSat. So I was working on building the first CubeSats then, and then also was a, a research assistant for a laser interferometer mission called LISA. And uh, it was those engagements in Stanford that led to me joining SpaceX in 2004. Amazing. And then, you know, just for context, I, I a similar career trajectory, you know, graduated from school and then have been with ARC seven years, focusing on robotics, energy storage, and space companies. Uh, and then we have Brett Winton on the line. And Brett, do you want to give a, a quick background of yourself? Sure. I'm Brett Winton. I direct research for ARC. I have done no real engineering, unlike you, Bulent, though I have an engineering degree. So, Bulent, did you just graduate Stanford and then they uh, ship you out to the uh, Pacific Islands in Omelette? Was it just a Stanford to, to middle of nowhere or, or what, what took place? There was a little bit of a gap in between, uh, meaning uh, I got to be in LA for a little while. Uh, I joined in 2004. It was definitely a, different than all the other conversations I was having at that time for uh, what to do after finishing Stanford. And, uh, and what was definitely apparent was this was a get stuff done kind of company. I was going to get my hands dirty. So that's what made me choose. And that's exactly what it is. Um, I didn't immediately go to the middle of the Pacific. Back then, we didn't have the Kwajalein launch site. We didn't even have the Vandenberg launch site yet, which was our first launch site. Um, but I, I remember at the end of my first day, I sent my first design out for manufacturing. So it took me one day to sit down and actually design a, a printed circuit board for a test equipment and send it out. So that actually gave the pace for me for the rest of the time at the company. And uh, uh, from there, uh, I spent quite a bit of time in Texas first, getting the first vehicle and the first engine checked out, taking it out to Vandenberg, doing a static fire. Then we lost that, uh, lost that launch site, so we built another one in Kwajalein. And I want to say one and a half years into SpaceX, and I was already uh, doing the flights between uh, Los Angeles and Kwajalein quite often. Amazing. And then post SpaceX, you, you were at Airbus, is that correct? So yeah, I took a, I want to say in hiatus between, um, between 2014 and 2016, where I was at Airbus for about half of that time. Um, I did, uh, 
digital transformation and innovation at uh, Airbus Defense and Space, actually based out of Germany, and got to see the other side of the uh, other side of the uh, type of companies. Actually, uh, definitely uh, have a respect for what they have achieved so far. Um, it's a different type of company. It's definitely a much more multinational conglomerate, which has different uh, different paths of decision making and different uh, different ways of operating. And um, yeah, definitely made quite a bit of friends there and quite a bit of uh, uh, interfaces there. But ultimately decided that I um, I wanted to go back to SpaceX in 2016. Gotcha. And now you know the reason the reason we're so excited to have you on is you know now you're CEO of Mineric. Can you can you kind of give us the the road that you took to get here and to to join and and start the space laser company and and what that even means. Yeah, um, overall, so as I said, in 2016, I got to go back to SpaceX. Um, I was given the uh, title of um, Vice President of Mission Assurance for the Starlink program, which was an assurance uh, position to make sure that we were both technically and business-wise building the right constellation. I think the Starlink program is very well known, and I don't have to say much about it. It really introduced me what constellations can be, what one can achieve with them, Um Thousands of satellites doing the job that was done, um, I want to say, poorly earlier due to technical difficulties and what the, what the technology was out of the geostationary belt. Um, we, um, we were doing with thousands of satellites from low Earth orbit, at least the, the, back then it was a plan only. And it was the idea of bringing up a bandwidth and taking down latency to be competitive enough with uh, terrestrial, op- uh, terrestrial offerings and in many cases be, uh, be the offering that um, can get anyone uh, internet that in the, uh, in the terrestrial ways couldn't get any because they were in a underpopulated or in a geographically difficult location or they were in some kind of a mobility situa- situation, maybe airplane, uh, uh, ship, yacht, oil and gas platform and whatnot. I left that job and SpaceX in, at the end of 2017. Uh, spent a little bit of time out there doing some amount of investments into the space myself, uh, just kind of like an angel investor. But understanding what uh, what a constellation was, I also knew what laser communication, or actually in the full name is full space optical communication, can do. And that is, um, it's a technology that can connect satellites with each other at tremendous bandwidth. And when we look at the... Uh, when we look at constellations today, we are seeing these thousands of satellites being launched into space, um, and they are all access points for the users that they serve below them. We realize that they all need to be networked. So the company I'm the CEO of, and actually it's a 12-year-old company uh, founded in 2009, uh, the company I'm the CEO of, Mineric, what they build is exactly that equipment. It's that optical communications terminal that sends a laser beam from one satellite to another for, uh, and allows it to communicate with tremendous bandwidth over vast distances. We can do up to 8,000 kilometers. We can do uh, 100 gigabits a second at very low, uh, a very low power consumption. And one of the other things we do is we don't have to use any spectrum for it. So you don't have to get any regulatory approvals or anything. So when you build a constellation today for building uh, constellations uh, like Starlink and whatnot, optical communications built the backbone of it. Before we dive into the to the optical and all of the nitty gritty there, maybe we just set the stage. Um, so how how does the satellite system constellation work today without optical uh, communication? What's what's the current mechanism for that communication? Exactly. So if you think about it all in the in analog terms to terrestrial networks, if you if you're a part of a um, cell phone network, for example, you get connected to a tower. And the tower itself needs to be connected to the rest of the network in the world. And it is done via some kind of a cable coming to the, uh, to the tower or maybe a microwave backhaul or something like that that takes all the, all the traffic that uh, comes from all the devices that are connected to that cell phone tower to back, back to the rest of the world. The same thing needs to happen for a satellite. They need some kind of a network access for, to be able to serve internet uh, to all the users that, is, that are connected directly to that user. If you do not have an optical communications terminal that connects you to the rest of the satellite such that you can build your mesh network directly in space, what you need to do is bounce the, um, the user needs to bounce the signal off of the satellite and right back to Earth. So the satellite has to have some kind of an access point for itself 
somewhere in view such that it can do what's called a bent pipe connection and immediately inject your traffic into the internet. Um, it works. You can definitely do this, um, but you have tremendous um, uh, limitations when you do that. The problem comes from the fact is you may be in an area that there are no ground stations, or for that matter, ground station could be feasible to be built, but there is no internet junction points to work with. Um, you could be in the middle of the ocean. And there, it's, it's a place where you want to actually uh, provide internet because let's face it, or else 70% of the time you're spending your time not generating any revenue. Or it could be in a geographically limited location. Many reasons why a ground station may not be possible. So if you're building your constellation without satellite to satellite communication, you are quite limited in the geographies where you can do business. And it's not like you can concentrate your satellites in that one location. Um, the satellites by themselves constantly go around the world. So wherever they are, they have no ground station in sight. They would be just assets that are not generating any revenue. So overall, um, making a network in space between the satellites, using these laser links, really that mesh network makes a lot of business sense. What about the downlink side? You also have sat or lasers that uh, provide the downlink as well. Is that as meaningful a part of kind of like the overall vision or is that kind of more um, kind of esoteric and narrow in terms of its application? I want to say my next vision is quite grand. Um, and it isn't just communications networks, um, communications constellations. There are many different types of constellations in the world. Um, they start, of course, with the communications constellations because they, make, uh, they are built around thousands of satellites. But we also know Earth observation and many other constellations will exist. And therefore, Mineric has a broad product palette. We do space terminals that do uh, satellite to satellite and satellite to ground to, uh, communication. We do air terminals that do air to ground, air to air, and very soon air to space. And then we have ground terminals who can exactly do ground to air or ground to, ground to space and vice versa. In the case of the communications constellations like OneMeb or Telesat or Starlink, the ground laser link is less of a uh, asset to bring in. The reason being that laser um, is an optical, it's a visual communication, or visual is probably the right word, but it's an optical communication and it needs a line of sight. And that line of sight can be hindered by something like a cloud, something we don't have to deal with in space. But when you're trying to go into cloud, it can become a uh, blocker to your ground communication. When you're doing an Earth observation constellation, that is not an issue because you can reroute your data to some other ground station through, uh, through your other satellites and downlink the data there, adding maybe a latency of a second or two. And when you're just uh, downloading images, that is not an issue. But when you're doing communications constellations, you want a pure real-time low latency communication and you don't want to be rerouting data. Therefore, our uh, communications constellations most of the time look for downlink capability with radio that are immune to the, the cloud effect. Why does it add that much latency? I mean, you're operating at the speed of light. Is it you have to hop multiple times to find a non-cloudy location? Or is it a, I would think you could create like a, a dense enough network of ground terminals where you could actually just like find your way through the clouds relatively locally. Not so. Yes, you could, but again, we're, we're fighting milliseconds here, and even the speed of, light, uh, speed of light can add milliseconds at the distances we're going. Um, and you're absolutely right. I think 90, 95% of today's internet traffic wouldn't care about additional milliseconds of latency. A very good example is streaming and whatnot, and I think advanced constellations that can uh, decide on what to do on depending on the type of traffic can reroute the data as accordingly and use optical downlink to really increase the uh, capabilities of the constellation. But every now and then, just like you're doing today, you're doing voice communication where every millisecond hurts. Um, gaming definitely has one of the higher, uh, higher uh, uh, levels of quality necessary. So there are applications where you need that pure, uh, pure low latency communication, financial communication being another one. So again, the answer is in the clear black and white. And as constellations grow and they become more com uh, complex and uh, capable, they will definitely use optical communications to reroute the uh, uh, latency non-critical data down. And that way it can also save a lot of spectrum, which for them is the most critical resource because they need to keep that spectrum mostly for user links because that's what makes them money.
it seems to me that the actually that ground station layer, even for communication, um, could be an interesting mechanism by which um, second to market or third to market competitors can actually enter a market where the spectrum has been essentially blocked off by the first to market player. Uh, so is that an opportunity you see? Yes, absolutely. I think we see um, more and more um, getting into the communications business in space, but in pretty much in any domain to be uh, to be difficult by the limited spectrum. Um, this is a way to be um, optical communications is a way to be spectrum efficient. Um, at the end of the day, when you're connecting, of course, to a cell phone or something, you're going to be using radio and some spectrum, but it is a good way to keep your footprint as low as possible so you can really find the opportunities and the bits of uh, spectrum you find is really just for that user link. All the other stuff you can do over optical. So it definitely represents an opportunity for newcomers. I guess uh, along those lines, it, it seems like it's also the opportunity to basically operate in countries that where um, kind of allocation of spectrum is not allowed at all or in a non-interfering way um, to navigate around great firewalls and, and use. Essentially, we have global networks of satellites and it's much harder to block a laser than it is um, kind of RF or provide interference against a laser than it is RF. Uh, that ties into the military application to some degree, but also uh, commercially, it seems like that's a potentially useful um, avenue that companies might want to explore. Absolutely. Um, so at the end of the day, of course, that's a strategic decision in order for any constellation, for any commercial endeavor to offer services in a country that they need to get uh, obtain something called landing rights um, or else they would be in violation of that country's laws. Um, the landing rights allows them to sell equipment there that allows them to uh, connect to the uh, satellite. And without be those rights, you're not even allowed to put in RF emissions into that country. So overall, there is a legal framework that uh, allows them to sell services. But of course, when you think about the strategic side, and when you think about what's happening in today's world, like in, U in the Ukraine crisis, strategic communications that cannot be blocked, that cannot be interfered with, that can't even be detected, is a big uh, is a big advantage on your side and optical communications exactly has that it can be detected it's not vis uh, visible laser it's infrared and uh, it in itself if you're not in the beam and you're not blocking the beam you can't even stop anyone from communicating that's a huge advantage over radio communication and that allows you to communicate in a stealth fashion in areas where there is um, there is, where there is adversaries that are trying to block it or jam it. Um, we've seen this over and over again in the current, uh, in the current crisis that a, uh, a worthy adversary can definitely do that. A sophisticated adversary is definitely immediately attacking your communications infrastructure and having that resilience of optical comms is great. And that's very often what um, drives um, beyond just space many people into uh, using optical comms in these tactical communications. If you look at our air offering today, one of the uh, biggest um, beachhead markets for us is drone to drone to drone communication or drone to ground station or even very soon uh, drone to satellite where, um, where you're trying to do a stealth uh, stealth, I want to say, observation or stealth uh, imaging mission over uh, adversary territory or contested territory. And it allows you to take those images and real time send it back. And uh, it allows you to do that without being uh, recognized or being identified. And so then that ties into the, the security element as well, I imagine, where how, how precise does the uh, laser need to be in order for you to receive the message? And is this lead to the complication in, in implementation? Uh, right, obviously radio wave, those are, you know, depending on the frequency, fairly large, and you just gotta intercept it at some point. With laser, is it hyper precise? That's very good and very accurate um, description of what it is. Um, so a laser beam, just in, in the name, of course, it's a tiny little beam. It's, um, it's laser sharp at the end, then after 8,000 kilometers, when it actually, for example, when we're doing satellite to satellite communication and we're going a distance of 8,000 kilometers, the beam doesn't widen much more than a few meters. Um, that is really the complications of it. Um, it's trying to keep the laser beam on the communications partner is what, what makes optical communications 
so difficult and it's the uh, it's something being mastered by v only a very few companies out uh out in the, uh out there and uh also, it was uh, a uh, technology that was very tough to make it a mass producible or even cost effective. So that really was um, that, that really is what we worked on. And you're absolutely right. That is also the tactical advantage. When you're um, when you're communicating, for example, from the spacecraft to the ground, and you have your ground station there, the incoming laser beam hits the ground station and maybe a few meters around it. Well, if your adversary is pitching up a tent and putting up another ground station, you'd probably see it if it was a couple of meters right next to yours. So it is really tough to intercept. With radio frequency, that is very often kilometers wide. So you can definitely intercept it. And radio has this um, un um, unique part of it too, uh, which is the better your antenna, um, even the best antennas uh, have some amount of side lobes where uh, information goes also in directions you don't intend it to go, and therefore it can be intercepted in many other ways as well. I want to get to kind of talking about production and costs in a moment, but I'm interested in the kind of drone to drone communication side because we've always thought of kind of like basically everything above the ground being um, competitive with each other in some way. Like if you look at um, like satellite imaging of, of agriculture, for example, actually with autonomous drones, you can probably do it a lot better, more precise and more persistent. Uh, and, and so uh, it seems in the future world, particularly if you can do laser, for instance, control of, of distant aircraft by bouncing the signal across, you could end up with not just low Earth orbit um, satellite constellations, but really like um, low Earth, I mean, air uh, drone constellations that are constantly buzzing around um, and and bouncing signals back. Um, do you think that that's a um, plausible future scenario? And, and could could your business become bigger in in kind of like the non um, non orbital aerospace than it ends up being in in orbital aerospace? It could be. At the end of the day, this is one of those key technologies that will. Um, take its own life um, um, of uh, building up of uh, building up of capabilities that we don't even think about. When we think about it, um, since the Second World War, our ways of wireless communication th between any two things have been the same: radios. This is the first time we actually have a wireless communications means that does not use radios, but something completely different. And it is a fundamental shift with its own unique opportunities and challenges. And what the unique opportunity will bring with it is a whole application spectrum we don't even think about today. And one of the things that really excites me is the fact that this non-regulated uh, portion of optical comps, you don't have to do a big FCC application, go work with other people that you may be interfering with, or they may be interfering with you. You need to do a whole coordination. You don't need to do any of it. And if you think about it, that nature of radio communication led us to some of the biggest bureaucracies we have that were necessary, the FCC, the ITU. We have a huge administrative burden today whenever we want to wirelessly communicate with each other. Um, we don't have that in LaserCom. What does that mean? We can do things ad hoc. We can just stand up and think, today I'm going to fly this drone mission from here to here, and I'm just going to do this communication there, and you don't have to register, you don't have to deconflict or anything. You can just build it, and that is a big advantage. We can just think of scenarios, make them happen outside of that regulatory framework, and that can just really accelerate the, uh, the, the speed of innovation of any type of implementation today that requires wireless communication. Within that context, Maneric talks about kind of having an, I think that you call it open standards or, uh, you know, ability for people to develop on top of the platform very easily. That's in contrast to what and, and how do you achieve that? Do you have to get like the industry to all agree on that? Or is that just like publishing open specs for how people plug in? What does that look like? So overall, there's multiple ways we make sure that our, uh, our terminals and our technology is easy to use. Um, first of all, um, we are, of course, a part of um, the Department of Defense and the Space Development Agency's um, initiatives to, um, to use a low Earth orbit um, constellation, the National Defense Space Architecture, to build a large constellation um, provide, uh, of satellites provided by multiple different companies to build a mesh network around the world for multiple different uh, military uh, needs. 
in that context, we worked with multiple optical communications uh, terminal providers to define a standard that allows these terminals to talk to each other. In that standard, we did not really push the envelope of what optical comms can be, such that more uh, optical communications uh, companies can be a part of that standard. We as a company are one of the few that really can do the high-end stuff, like 100 gigabit plus, or uh, really long distances. But we decided to keep that standard low, such that there can be more uh, participants in it. And we developed that, and we are a part of it. So that allows multiple companies to work in that a few gigabits per second together uh, using that standard and be interoperable. But then when we go to the really high-end um, high communication, which we, uh, for example, with our Condor Mark III terminal support, 100 gigabits plus, we actually even are working on a terabit solution, we use actually terrestrial standards. We do not want to be reinventing the wheel. So our, the, our communication standards comes from the terrestrial fiber network standards where there is uh, multiple standards out there and we support all of them. Um, the uh, chipsets, the electronics we do support all of them. And then when it comes to the actual physical implementation, how we guide the lights, what colors we use, what polarization and whatnot, we make all of them configurable on the fly such that if you want to talk one day to that uh, person's terminal that may not be coming from minor, you can decide to configure that terminal that way. And then the next way, next day, another way, maybe the one, one day after that, you talk to a minor terminal. So we made it both adaptable, but also made sure that on the digital uh, stack, we implemented what was already invented on, on Terraforma. It seems like in this space, industry specifically, and a lot of what you're talking about is, is, is you know, potentially it's a, a technology that enables a lot of disruption and enables a lot of innovation velocity. Uh, and then there's like a, at least to me, there's this interesting interface between kind of then the military use application side where um, both the purchasing kind of time cycles and um, just proving that something works up to spec is, is much longer kind of sales cycle and sales momentum. Are those two kind of like characteristics reconcilable? Is, is that gap changing or, or do you think it's just kind of like you have to always be a two stroke business? Um, to a certain extent, we are a two stroke business, but we don't see it that bad. Um, what we as a business have done, and I, I'm just, uh, just like uh, with the answer on the last question, uh, we made a very adaptable, very easily configurable terminal that can that can uh, answer a whole breadth of um, of applications. So for us, it's not a big uh, it's not a big um, uh, overhead to be uh, developing terminals for the military, the governmental use, or the commercial use. It just it's a difference in timelines and the customer acquisition, but not in the back end of fulfilling what the requirements are. So. I think there is going to be uniqueness um, in the way, uh, for example, the US DOD buys their uh, equipment and wants them produced and everything. Um, we can accommodate it. We do ac accommodate that. But overall, the most important thing is that we, uh, with our implementation, made, made that burden to be very little. Um, if you had a more, I want to say, rigid implementation, I think you would have to come up with a solution for every customer uniquely. Can you talk about within your kind of cost decline and manufacturing side. One of the things Sam and I talk about a lot is is the benefits versus drawbacks of vertical integration. And I know you're using some consumer electronics components and, and space testing them. And then you're using some kind of particularly, I think your optics are vertically integrated. How, how do you like balance that trade off and think about it? And how do you know, like, oh, well, this is something we have to do in house versus this is something that we can source um, broadly? Yeah. One of the unique things about what we build is it's very analog to what the fiber industry is doing here on the ground. We do fiber communication pretty much between satellites, just without the fiber in between. We just do lasers and where the cable would carry the uh, light, we let the vacuum of space or through atmosphere, let it go freely. When you think about that, you realize that we are on the back of a multi-billion dollar industry. So there is a lot of R&D that has happened to build commodity equipment that supports the fiber industry. When it comes to amplifiers and uh, A6 and DSPs, different kind of chips that modulate and demodulate the signal and whatnot, there, it, there was tremendous research and tremendous uh, industrial base that was built that we do not need to replicate. 
There, we do not mind going in and buying components from an established industry um, that's, um, that's just cost-efficient execution, and uh, we can just benefit from there. But there are also unique parts to what we do, and I think you really, um, uh, uh, you really identified the one that is very unique of what we do is the fact that in order to not send it over cable, but over free air or free, uh, the, the vacuum of space, you need to have a precise way of guiding that light through, uh, through multiple hundreds, if not thousands of kilometers, and that is your optics. You need to have a perfect telescope that can work over a wide variety of temperatures and still send that signal in a very repeatable way in the direction you want it to go. And you need to be align all of those. To do that is not very easy. And up until recently, the only way to do it was very expensive optics and probably also from some very esoteric materials. You were using maybe silicon carbide, you were using ceramics or many other things that uh, built a very rigid terminal and were driving the cost of the terminals, um, ours as well. So what did we do? We, um, as soon as we were past the prototype phase, we identified that, uh, that element as one of the main cost drivers of our terminal. And we started the R&D program on how to do everything we do out of metal optics, just building our optics out of just aluminum and really shaping it and uh, processing it in such a way that it, uh, that it gives us a very cost efficient solution that can be mass manufactured and uh, will be a unique selling point and an advantage of us versus our competitors. And we decided to do that. We brought that in-house. It took us many years to perfect that IP, but we brought the design in-house, we brought the uh, capability house, we brought the whole production in-house, and that is giving us an edge. And that, allows us to build, that allowed us to build a cost-effective terminal. We will do that make versus buy over and over again, but I think in places where there is a commodity market on, on Earth, we will be using that market. Do you think that the production will remain in-house as you scale? As in, you know, I can understand why this is the critical like capability driver for your business. So you have to kind of bring it all in to figure out how it all works together. You need quick iteration cycles. So you need to build the pieces yourself. But then once your um, kind of design, call it solidifies, do you think then it's, oh, let's go out and get it contract manufactured and, and we can keep up the standards? Or do you think that, more call it SpaceX style, you would continue to manufacture in-house even as you're trying to scale manufacturing? For the foreseeable future, I would expect it to stay in-house. Um, it, so one of the ways you can go out of house is when you identify manufacturers with experience in the same type and in the same uh, quantities of what you're producing. And today, we built something quite unique. Uh, with precision and uh, with precision at quantities that do not exist at least at the price points nearly close uh, nearly at all at the price points that we that we look at. So, for us to be a competitive uh, provider, we need to stay in house for quite some time to come. That doesn't mean that the technologies we you utilize today do not have other applications in the future that would be, that would not become. Uh, high volume applications that would then uh, themselves spring up contract manufacturers with the capabilities they're looking for. At that point in time, when you can use the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the unit economics of other people doing similar things in the high numbers, then of course we would go out. But today, it's not like there are contract manufacturers out there that build metal optics at the precision that we're looking at for other applications in the thousands. As soon as they're done, uh, there, I think we would definitely consider it. Is it all kind of um, mechanical uh, in terms of your ability to deliver performance, or is there also like stuff you can do at the software level to to correct against kind of mechanical tolerances? Like, does is there any kind of you know I don't know exactly how it would manifest, but in terms of guiding the beam or or anything where 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 software plays a role in the cost decline, or is it all just kind of mechanical improvements over time? Absolutely. The whole system plays a big role in the performance of our communication. So it isn't just mechanical. The way the um, communication works is as the more um, imperfections and deviations from the optimal product you introduce, the more hits you take to what we call the uh, link budget. 
And the link budget exactly says how, uh, what the performance of a link between two laser terminals will be. And as you have imperfections, that, uh, that goes down, but there are ways we can make up for it in the way we encode the signal, do forward error correction, or for that matter, account for how the satellite is vibrating that may also distort the light that, uh, that's coming in or going out. So yes, software plays a role, but one also has to say that unlike the radio frequency communication, in optical communication, the roll off of quality is very fast. From going from a perfectly functioning uh, terminal or a link to no link, just a little bit of deviation and you can end up there. So the amount of, uh, the, the amount of mechanical imperfections we can make up for is still limited, but it's not zero. Software does play a role and we have a fantastic software to, uh, to really account for the couple of effects. I think the one effect that we actually account for the most and make up for software is, it's not even uh, something of our terminal, but actually of the, of the uh, vehicle that we are installed on. As you can imagine, if you are a perfect, term, a perfect terminal sending a laser beam out, but if the satellite or the aircraft is vibrating, that's going to move the beam back and forth and back and forth, and we have to keep that beam perfectly on the communications partner. As the satellite vibrates, that is fighting against that. And we, in software, in our control systems, use some very fast-moving mirrors to account for that. And the better your algorithm, the control system there, the better you can make a link. So that's where probably the, uh, most of the black magic comes in. I think you're in a unique position because you know, you're one of the first people to be doing this. And uh, with cost declines, one of the hardest things I find as an analyst is you, know, you have to find cumulative production and cost in order to get a, a good slope. But you know, you're, you're here creating some of the first ones. So when you look at it, you know, what, what's the type of cost decline trajectory you've seen from, you know, first unit produced to 10th unit produced to 100th unit produced? There is, first of all, the cost decline that happened to the first generation of optical communication terminals that were deployed. Um, some of the optical communication devils deployed up until very recently um, have been only really in scientific or strategic missions, and they carried price tags of $10, $15 million a terminal. Since then, through uh, engagements of ours and some other companies, we have brought that multiple orders of magnitude down. So two orders of magnitude down. And uh, the optical communication terminals now have a price tag that constellations that need them in the thousands can afford. As far as our own cost, uh, uh, cost reduction of our terminals goes, it has been quite, uh, quite steep, actually. It's been quite great to see as we produce more and more units that the cost goes down and the, there is a curve that we are, uh, that we are quite uh, excited about. Um, when we were building our first terminals, we were, uh, we were close to that million, uh, million dollar mark when we were just building one unit alone. And that was really very much driven by the fact that we were doing machine setups and uh, all of these one-off non-recurring engineering and non-recurring setup costs for a single unit. From there, we were able to decrease the cost to a, uh, less than half of it. Um, very, in our next batch, when we were doing just double-digit production. And in the meantime, we are at a point where we are um, looking at margins of 40%, uh, 35, 40% of our gross margins on our products of 35, 40% um, with, um, with, um, uh, with costs that are quarter million or less. And uh, we can really uh, keep up that pace as the cost of the terminal, as we sell it to the customer, the price of the terminal uh, is decreasing. And uh, we are seeing that already with hundreds of terminals kicking in. And uh, we are seeing also a couple of techno technological advances we can do to further reduce that as the numbers go up and it pays off uh, for us to do that next technological uh, step forward, which requires some amount of R&D. Um, there is definitely some capabilities out there we are quite excited about, like using uh, MEMS mirrors, uh, that mirror, those mirrors, those really fast moving mirrors that I talked about that earlier. Today, they are, uh, they are more costly and larger than a MEMS mirror would be. MEMS technology could be, uh, could be uh, uh, utilized there soon with some amount of research. And there's some other things like that that could get us, uh, get, get us into even better uh, cost sectors. One of the things we see is in some products, it's like 
you get to a cost threshold that is um, meaningful for a large enough segment of customers where then kind of like the price of the product to the end customer stays constant, but then you're just delivering performance improvements on top. Do you have a sense for at the terminal level where that kind of cost threshold would be where like the unit economics work for like a big enough population of customers that you could kind of sit at that price and then I don't know if it's delivering more bandwidth or, or just a, a higher um, higher precision or, or what metric you'd improve, but or do you think it's more of like a, you continue to drive down the cost curve because you're just opening up to more and more segment? I'd say it depends on the customer segment and even for what we do, there is segmentation. I think for most of the um, satellite constellations out there that do not pass the a few thousand satellites mark, um, the answer is not from me, but actually comes from DARPA. Um, DARPA just has an initiative called Space Bacon, which is the creation of a very adaptable communications terminal. And there they actually talk about the dream price almost openly, which is the 100K uh, limit. And they already acknowledge that we are not there yet. Uh, but uh, one, one would be in an ideal situation when that is achieved. And I think that's a good number to keep in mind for the non tens of thousands of constellations. The only place where I see that price not working out is when you're suddenly deploying tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of satellites. And there are thoughts in both of those categories. They require a smaller, uh, they do require a smaller price. But I think that there it's also where you can suddenly look for requirements that are quite a bit more relaxed. Today, if you're talking about 8,000 kilometers and then you're putting 10 or if not 100,000 satellites up there, distances tend to be a lot shorter. Uh, precision doesn't need to be there. And uh, suddenly you have a couple of tricks you can use to get to those uh, target numbers and those need to be achieved. There has to be, uh, there has to be solutions for that. And we have uh, some of ideas, some ideas for how we would get there. If I'm bouncing, you know, halfway around the world, or is there, is the number of satellite bounces of uh, actually more meaningful contribution to latency than, than, um, speed of light and is that something that you need to optimize to like as in receive a signal send a signal you know moving through that that chip is probably you know you're you're taking more time steps there than on waiting for the light beam to travel to the next so does that is that kind of like an economic balance and, and performance balance that people will make it's a system question to be honest where we are a very small contributor in every hop um in every satellite hop uh, we are actually almost insignificant in the way you would, uh, you would think about latency. But overall, it comes from one of our terminals and before it comes to the, uh, goes to our, the next terminal of ours, in the middle, of course, it goes through the uh, router of the satellite that routes all the data, makes decisions. And that implementation is probably the thing that's, uh, that in, inserts the most amount of hop penalty per satellite. It really depends on that implementation, but there is a hop penalty to it. So if you have advanced capabilities to route the data and do um, uh, skip satellite communication, meaning, hey, if I'm going to go across the ocean and instead of talking to the satellite directly in front of me, I'm going to start when I'm uh, right above New York, I'm going to talk exactly to the satellite right um, maybe mid-ocean before I go to London and skip 10 satellites that can be a good implementation. And that requires exactly the type of agile, the long, agile long distance and, uh, and capable uh, terminals like the ones that Mineric does. So yes, actually, we could be a contributor to the solution there if the system requires it. Thank you for giving us so much time. And before we wrap up, one, one more technical rabbit hole to go down, if we can. And that's, you know, looking at, you know, you're talking about the system, you're talking about the whole system. And I think that's meaningful. You know, we've looked at cost of bandwidth, uh, dollars per bandwidth in orbit. And one of the biggest constraints is power. Uh, and you're, you're noting that optical communication is lower power. Uh, is there any quantifiable metric there on a, you know, per bandwidth, how much less power does optical require versus radio? If all of a sudden you can have lower power, does that mean you can have smaller satellite much much cheaper to get into orbit? Or, you know, you send up a big satellite and as you said, now you're using terabit optical and that's capable because 
the size constraint of the solar panels now is enough to accommodate that. Let me give an anecdotal answer to the uh, to how much power we use versus how much uh, radio frequency is. Today, um, one satellite constellation that we know of that uses uh, radio frequency, for about the same power we use to get 100 gigabits across in their radio implementation, can get about 6 to 8 megabits across. So there you can see watts per bit is many, many orders of magnitude difference. So we are talking about a, uh, a quantum leap in, uh, in, uh, in bandwidth uh, available. Um, so it makes a huge difference. Um, what it does is it allows, it frees up power to do as you wish. That's the most important part. And I think the, we want to make the satellite system to be as easy to design. And people will do their own decision on what to do with that extra power. Some people may decide to go for low, smaller satellites. And I think that is probably where most people will go. But my belief is that power generation in orbit will get cheaper and lighter per kilowatt over the next couple of years. We have a lot of secondary waste, weight, and cost going towards power generation that is going to get optimized over the next couple of years. And that is going to result in people having more and more excess power. And that's going to go towards the user links, towards providing from set per satellite more those radio links towards their users because they're not spending all of that power sending this information from uh, satellite to satellite, but actually they're using all the power to serve more people. And the more people you serve per satellite, the more money it's generating. So there is an optimization curve there, and it doesn't always have to be immediately the smaller satellite. And if we follow the uh, space industry and we think about uh, Starship coming online, I think people are going to stop optimizing around weight here very soon. I think the best one to optimize towards is revenue generated per satellite. So then this ties in, in our big ideas last year, um, and maybe we'll need to revisit this now that we've got more, more information and optical communications coming online. But so in uh, 2004, the cost per gigabit per second in orbit was $300 million. Uh, and that's come down to, you know, roughly $40,000 per gigabit per second. And, you know, our expectation is that in the next year, in the next five years, that could fall 40 fold to uh, $1,000 per gigabit per second in orbit. We'll need to crunch these numbers and, and see if it, it changes this trajectory or, or if this is the innovation that keeps us on that curve. I think overall, multiple things are happening in this space side. It's not just the optical communications, but we will definitely benefit a lot from the, uh, the constant uh, decline in launch cost. Starship, we are quite excited about, but all every launch vehicle we are quite excited about. I mean, there are so many launch vehicles up there that are either in development or final stages of integration and launch. It only is going to benefit the, the space sector. And then we're seeing the effects on the component makers, and I see quite a bit of um, movement happening in, in space power generation. We're going to see the same kind of quantum leaps that optical communications has done, but we have done in all this domain as well. And as we're wrapping up, I think we need to touch on the fact that, you know, Mineric is punching far above its weight. You know, I don't think, I don't think as many people know about you as, as they should, but you're already getting a lot of validation from the big players out there. Uh, you've partnered and you have a partnership with Northrop Grumman. And then as of yesterday, uh, this announcement of L3 Harris, and they're taking a position in the company as well. Uh, and so can you kind of talk about what, what these mean uh, for you, for the technology? Uh, and do you think, you know, slowly this technology is going to just become more commonplace? It'll, it'll seep into more common knowledge as this becomes the standard. Our partners, yes, definitely Northrop Grumman and L3 Harris and um, many others that out there that we work with, I think understand what optical communications can bring to it. And they are realizing that it has to be a technology that, uh, that, uh, that has to be brought up to uh, mass manufacturing, cost efficiency, uh, high readiness level, a dependable technology that can be installed over and over again into smaller and big programs out there. 
So these partnerships are a validation of what we have been saying over uh, the last more than a decade uh, since the uh, founding of Mineric. It is a validation that, uh, that says once someone invests into this technology and brings it up to this readiness level, puts in the capabilities to mass manufacture it, um, that there is going to be a market that will consume these uh, terminals. So this validation goes a long way showing that the investments we have done on our side have been valid, that the market is coming, and that these large players want to be involved in it, um, shaping exactly that, uh, that market and what uh, is offered in that market along with us. We are quite happy that we have gained those partners' insights into the different uh, markets they have, uh, who understand, for example, what the U.S. government, but also many commercial players are looking for in the air, ground, and space domain. So. I think overall, these uh, partnerships will lead to us knowing our customer base better, uh, offering probably even uh, combined solutions for many of the uh, uh, problems that are facing them and their customers. If you had to fast forward, and this uh, will close it off here to respect your time, but if you had to fast forward and, and either A, Mineric failed to reach the kind of scale and strategic footprint that, that you envisioned for and or like optical communication for satellites failed to scale and, and become um, kind of like this really interesting strategic communication tool for satellites. What would be the mechanisms by which that happened? What are the fail modes here that you're trying to de-risk that you're um, kind of worried about that keep you up at night as a CEO? Well, there are many things to always uh, being worrying, worried about, but one thing I'm definitely not worried about is that the demand for optical comms isn't going to come. I think if you asked me this a couple of years ago, I would have probably said, you know, constellations will take longer and they are going to, um, as they built them, they're going to lose their trust in optical comms that it can't be done or it can't be done cost effectively. So they're not going to De deploy it and whatnot. I think I've lost those worries. Um, it has been such a demand and um, the amount of business development relationships we've built over the last couple of years really have shown such a demand for what we built that it is really the execution that's important today. Um, the execution means that we need to have the production capabilities, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the quality level and everything that our customers demand that make their business case. And that's what we work on today. I think uh, the market has, in the meantime, really materialized, especially the Space Development Agency, but also many constellations are out there, have committed to having optical comms. So I'm not seeing that chance of us not really having a place to deliver to. Now it's all about showing those numbers to, uh, to the customers, to the investors and everyone to show that we can execute along the path that already is given, um, that already is crystal clear out there. And is there a, like, if call it execution is hitting a certain performance threshold per cost, like, is there a single metric that you can define that is like the dollar per X that you need to deliver? You don't even have to give me a number, but what, what, what is the unit? I would say that um, the main unit right now is our fac maximum factory output. Today, we've put in, a, put in a factory that can deliver up to 2,000 terminals a year. And we want to go ahead and start going against that number very soon. The partnerships that we have built and the couple of uh, 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 opportunities that we are involved in go towards that direction, I think. But overall, then it's going to be really how, how fast we can scale up from there. One of the unique things, about, uh, uh, unique things about the space constellations that we deal with is that the demand is zero until you win them and suddenly they come in and they come in with a step function of suddenly needing hundreds of terminals a, a month. Therefore, the scalability of your solution, your factory design is probably the biggest driver. So for me, that is probably the metric that I'm keeping the, uh, the biggest uh, focus on right now. Um, that's the reason, for example, we designed our production facility from day one with commodity machinery, not some esoteric machinery that has to be built by on order, but by machines that are already are out there and can be bought as commodity and brought in at short time enabled and, and, uh, and uh, start running. So that is one of the things that we pay the most attention to. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, spending an hour with us this morning. And uh, 
we're going to be following very closely. We're excited. I'm a huge fan. I can't wait to have a satellite connection on a boat somewhere. But uh, thank you again for joining us. Well, Brett and Sam, thank you so much for making the time as well. And um, we'll, I'm sure talk again here very soon. And have wish you guys a great day. ARC believes that the information presented is accurate and was obtained from sources that ARC believes to be reliable. However, ARC does not guarantee the accuracy or completeness of any information, and such information may be subject to change without notice from ARC. Historical results are not indications of future results. Certain of the statements contained in this podcast may be statements of future expectations and other forward-looking statements that are based on ARC's current views and assumptions and involve known and unknown risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results, performance, or events to differ materially from those expressed or implied in such statements.